in the dicastery of promoting integral human development in the Vatican and who is leading the work on their COVID-19 commission. So he is a, I won't describe, I won't read his biography because we want him to talk about, you know, what he's doing himself, but he is a Catholic ethicist. He has a PhD in, uh, in uh, economics and Catholic social teaching. He's a very interesting background. He's a, he started life as a lawyer. So maybe he can explain why he, uh, he, 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 became, he went from a lawyer to being a priest. Um, so Augusto, welcome. Welcome to this uh, Fordham group. Um, thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Let, let's just start with, you, with your background, because some of us know you, some people don't know you. Um, like, you're a priest from Buenos Aires working as an adjunct secretary now in the Vatican. Um, walk us through your personal journey to this point. Where, tell us a little bit about your background. Um, well, thank you for the question. But uh, yes, I, I, I used to be a lawyer. Uh, unfortunately, well, unfortunately, no, but to my regret, not a human rights lawyer, I was a corporate lawyer working for the largest law firm in the world, which is a Chicago based law firm, Baker and McKenzie. And so I was traveling all over the world defending the big corporations and financial institutions. <laughs> So uh, that's the, the God's humor because now I'm I have uh -huh. to sit down uh, on the table in front of the CEOs of these companies, but to ask them to change. <laughs> the good the good thing is that I know them from within, uh, but um, and the good thing for me is according to my bishop, I was escaping from hell because according to my bishop, all lawyers go to hell. But well, that's not true. But anyway. <laughs> uh, then um, I received a call uh, working on, on a mission in summer and I entered the seminary and then I was sent to study more theology with the Jesuits at the same school where Bergoglio, uh, Cardinal Bergoglio used to be a master um, and in Colegio Maximo. Um, and then uh, well, I was living in a, in a shanty town in Greater Buenos Aires, also, and, and that, that experience was very important for me because then I decided to change from general ethics or more theology to specific uh, social ethics, not specific in economics. I discovered Buenos Aires is a rich city. We have an immense gap between pure and rich. This is there's something wrong. There's something we should. I I I, I was feeling the need to contribute to that, merging perhaps my background as a corporate lawyer and a theologian. So I, I, I was sent to study development economics um, in England. I, I, studied, I did a, a master's in development economics based on Amartya Sen's theory. And, uh, and then I did my, my PhD, all, all paid by, at the beginning, I, I was the only Catholic priest. I, I don't. I'm, I had to find out. I'm still the only one. I was paid by the British Council, which is a is a is public money from an Anglican government. <laughs> so uh, um, yeah, and um, and then because there were, there were not many priests or many theologians that are linking development economics with theology, uh, so the Catholic Development Agency of England and Wales they hired me. Is, is CAFOR is, is one of the leading around along CRS, not the equivalent of CRS in the US, in, but in England. And they hired me to amazingly to do a research on everything what the Catholic Church has said on development and environment. So, so I was finishing a postdoc in Cambridge, London. So I, I moved I, I, back, back to London. We did a massive research. And when we were finalizing the research, the Pope, Pope Francis decided to publish Laudato Si. So there, I, there I became famous because I was one of the few people who knew absolutely everything what the Catholic Church knew before Laudato Si. So I could say, and I've actually, they forgot to say, to quote this conference of bishops. I said it, so everybody, and then I was sent by the, we designed a program and Dominic Tyler is, I just, who is in the call, he helped me with some things there. 
a professor in economics. He, he used to be a professor in economics there in London. Now he's a Jesuit and helping with the Vatican COVID Commission. So the, we went to uh, Latin America, Africa, Asia, to the poorest region to analyze La Loto C with the communities that were affected by poverty and, and ecological crisis. And we analyzed the text with them. And that was an experience I will, that was this, one of the best experiences I've ever had in my entire life. Because even as a theologian, to study the, this text with these communities, that blew up my mind. I mean, the potential that this document has is immense. Sadly, I discovered well, that this document is not that well received in rich communities, which is our, <laughs> our role. No? But, the, um, but then when the Pope created this dicastery the, for internal human development, I was by default called because, uh, again, because there were not many that were doing that. Uh, and then he, he had the very strange idea to appoint, to appoint me a young secretary <laughs> of the entire thing plus of the Vatican COVID Commission. So I told the Pope uh, when he called me, are you serious? Yeah, yeah, but you are, you are, but you're mad. Ah, oh, yeah, but not, not as mad as you are, he told me. Okay, well, okay. <laughs> here I am. <laughs> That's great, what a great story. Before we get to the COVID Commission, tell you also worked on the Senate of the Amazon and, uh, and the work that led into the wonderful document Carida Amazonia. Could you talk a little about the Amazon Senate and how important that is uh, and what yes. you did on that? Sorry, yeah, because I've, that was another um, groundbreaking experience for me. Um, because not the Senate as such would last one month, but, but the process, because I was appointed like the, ex, uh, the expert or advisor for the Synod, no? and the process towards the Synod, it was the first time in history that we did that. So with the Pope Francis, it was the, same, the, the first time in history that the Synods were, they started to be a bit more open. Remember the first two Synods of the Amazon, they were at least asking bishops or asking families somehow. The Synod of the Youth, there was a pre-Synod with young people, the Synod of the Amazon, there was a two years process towards the Synod. So we did more than 190 um, gatherings of communities uh, in the Amazon, in the nine countries of the Amazon. And, from, and with that experience, we produced the, what is called the Documento Laboris, the Instrumento Laboris, the document preparing the Synod, no? we, upon which the, the, the bishops have to discuss but instead of having, instead of that being an invention of theologians or experts, or that was a synthesis of the list of the two-year process listen, listening, that was amazing, amazing. So, so and the synod was uh, was done with the participation of indigenous leaders, uh, of religious leaders. There were a lot of women involved as well, uh, and and it was a and from that. Well, of course, the fruit of that, the Synod of the Amazon is like a, a, a son or a daughter of Laudato Si, no? with Querida Amazonia. But now that opened the field to the new process of the new Synod process is about synodality. The, 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 the first attempt were the Synod for the Youth. An actual attempt was the Synod for the Amazon, but now the Pope is calling for a synod on synodality. <laughs> so, that, so this is the way the, the church can implement the Second Vatican Council, no? to, work, to work alongside all the uh, church agents towards building the kingdom of God or expanding the kingdom of God on earth. That's great. That's, that's wonderful. The importance of synodality for Pope Francis, I think will be a major uh, contribution of his pontificate. Let's switch gears a little to the work you're doing now to the COVID commission. When I, when I mentioned to people that, oh, my friend Father Augusto was leading this Vatican uh, COVID-19 commission, they often ask me, well, what, what is the Vatican doing about COVID? What does that mean? So can you tell us what that means? What exactly uh, is the commission? What's the goal? What areas are you looking at? Who do you consult? So tell us what you're up to. 
The commission, and I can, I can tell this freely because it's not just me, uh, it's, uh, again, it's an incredible experience. I will, tell, I will tell what the leader of the African task force said, that is a Jesuit. Um, he said, this is one of the best church experience I've had. So I'm not, I, it wasn't me, no? This is, but why is he saying that? Because the commission start, started a year ago, ish, when we, we did a research uh, on the, this virus that was coming up and nobody knew about it. We did a simple research on the number of uh, bed hospitals available worldwide and the number of people that could be infected. And it was so, like the number of, of, of bed hospitals like this, this size, and, and the pe people who could be affected are, was like that. <laughs> Were, and they said, this is, this is not true. And, it, and then we said to the Pope, listen, there's something very, very big coming up. We don't know how the governments will react, um, but the governments will have to do something completely different of what they are used to, because there's no public health system that could cope with this. And therefore, what is at risk is the consequence on jobs, on uh, on on the economy, on the move, on the on the tr transition towards an ecological an, ec an ecological econ economy, um, on on security, the, we are really, really, really worried. So the Pope uh, created this commission, and after that meeting, I remember one week after uh, Italy decided to close down the country. No, and then the rest is history. Because, but we, we the Pope decided this, anticipated the, the, the thing, and the Pope said, "Prepare the future. This is our our mission. Prepare the future. Don't wait to the future. Don't so so took this as an opportunity to Come on. prepare something different. And so with creativity." with agility because of the urgency, with a professionalism, you know, addressing the complexity of the matter. But, uh, and, and, and the crisis should be an opportunity for a new world. As, he, as, he, as, as you have said, uh, the Pope repeating every time he, he can, we cannot get out from this kind of crisis in the same way as we got into. We are going to get out better or worse. So let's take this opportunity to get out better of the crisis, for which we have to anticipate. We cannot wait till this is over. So they recover, and we don't want to recover anything that was unfair, unjust, unsustainable. Why do we have to recover that? <laughs> so let's 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 reinvent something new. So because this is a very difficult task, uh, then we divide it into five groups. One will be the listening and assisting local churches worldwide. So we have an eye on the ground and we assist the, church, the poorest churches in the world. Then another will be like a think tank. It's divided into task forces, economy, ecology, um, security and health, but only in an integral security, cyber security, food security, health security, uh, security, uh, national security, weapons, peace, etc. Um, economy, well, and all the economic problems, particularly on food, jobs, the public health system, the and the ecological recovery, but they have to work interconnect in an interconnected way, like applying la dotosi, basically. No, the other uh, work is in communication. All the dicastery of communication is involved. The fourth is the relationship with states and international organizations. The and the secretary of state is involved. Um, so we have it, it's interdicasterial, the pontifical academies are, uh, of life, for example, help, the uh, charity of the Pope also, but basically there's a mix of people and we work with in partnership with others. It's on, synodality in action. In partner, there's in the entire Georgetown University, for example, is part of the commission, the entire university, not one department or another. So this depends on, this depends on the vice president, on Thomas Banchoff, and he decided whom to call according to the needs. Then we have 
other institutions in the, well, just in the US have many Notre Dame universities network of uh, or Catholic peace uh, building or I can't remember the name, but something like that. Then we have universities in the UK. We have research centers. We have pop popular movements. We have individuals. We have, and from all of the world, and we have local task forces. We have a task force in Africa. We are developing one in Latin America, and we will develop in, in next semester one in Africa, in Asia. So, uh, so as you can see, it's a it's a very different way of working in the Vatican, <laughs> and, and 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 we are work we work a lot. <laughs> I have to say for me for my health, <laughs> but uh, but we 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 brought really committed professional young people. It's a lot of women in the in the team. Imagine if you were working in the Vatican. Suddenly there come all these young women professional. They, that, that we have to work interdisciplinary with others. It's, it's a feast, it's a feast for my work. But also we, we, we deliver some things. We work with, uh, with other task forces, uh, Anglicans, etc. Why is it important for the church? Because we have a, a perspective that is without any, first of all, because the Catholic Church, you know, we have more than 150,000 uh, health institutions, big health institutions worldwide. So we are a health agent player in the world, but also because look at the vaccine response, no? The vaccine response, everybody was, we, we, we have a holistic approach to the vaccine. Who is fi financing the vaccine? If it's public money, it has to be a public good. Who is producing the vaccine? Who, how is this distributed? How is this, the, 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 are we applying the, the trade compet com competition model? How it, how it is implemented, how, we, how, we do, how do we promote trust in the vaccine process? How, how much will it cost not to have, to have the people vaccinated, et cetera. So, and because all of that involves ethics and involves a lot of church agents, no? and, but the same with food. We are working now with FIO, with, uh, with uh, IFAD, with World Food Program, because we are facing a very serious food crisis because all the crises have been exacerbated due to the COVID but food is very important. Now we are working with the food summit. We are working with people on the ground on food. The same with, um, with jobs. How many millions and millions of people have lost their jobs? Not just in the US, think in Latin America. Latin America, 40% of Latin America uh, economic force is in under the, um, the informal economy. So how on earth? Can Latin American countries be sustained with COVID, with lockdowns? They are not under the poor countries in the UN system, so they're not, they are not even under COVAX, which is the, the channel through help and vaccines. So they have to, to borrow money to buy the, their own vaccines. Countries that are totally indebted, over indebted. <laughs> so you see how complex it is. So the church can help in address this. This is integral human development. That's why the commission is based, is rooted, is housed in the dicastery for promoting interhuman development. Sorry, stop me, uh, Tony, because I can yeah. speak forever. So ask no, me no, whatever you, you want. This is, <laughs> this is absolutely fascinating, Augusto. Thank, thank you so much. Just a general announcement. We will at some point in the next, maybe in around 15 minutes, I, or 15 to 20 minutes, I will ask people to put questions in the chat and uh, we can uh, direct some of those questions towards Father Augusto. But um, since you mentioned vaccines, let me just ask you about um, your position on that, because as you know, Thomas Aquinas said that, you know, in case of need, everything is common property. And from the way I look at things, when people are dying of a global pandemic, that's a, as great a need as you can get. What does that mean in terms of access to vaccines, thinking about things like intellectual property of pharmaceutical companies, funding of COVAX and things like that? What is, are you doing any thinking about these, about these issues to be, to, to be able to get the world vaccinated, not just the rich countries? Well, we're not just thinking, we're doing, I mean, both. Um, last year, we have, is, we have issued a, a document, it's called 20 points for a fair, a world on the vaccine. So we address the ethical issues on vaccine. 
and um, and then we propose six plan six uh, points for action. Now this year, what we're doing is that we are trying to implement those plans for action. Um, the the ethical thing of the vaccine, as I told you, the, the first one that we had to address was the biological components of the vaccine. Is it is it moral to get the vaccine if it has certain components, etc.? Well, we addressed that. It's it's clear that was not the case. As, uh, there's nothing to fear, and also. Um, it's not that we are killing people to, to produce the vaccine. That, that's, or, that's not true. <laughs> so um, then the second thing, the second thing is about a financial aspect of ethics. All the vaccines, there is a mix, there's a blend between public and private money. So this is not, so therefore cannot be addressed merely with a market mentality. I'm not saying that we have to ignore that. But this is a blend, so therefore has to be addressed differently. And also, we are in the midst of an emergency. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, it's true that we need to pay, we need to incentivize people so that they can research. And yeah, but how much does it cost? Because we are putting a lot of money to do that. And you, <laughs> so the people are putting a lot of money. So this should be treated in a public way. So that means that if the countries are not have not developed a good public health system because this could be the rule for public health systems. You cannot you cannot address this situation, and and it is happening in many countries in the world, not just in yours. No? So that requires a new thinking, and we are working on that. Uh, how how to um, we are working, and that includes, of course, the intellectual property rights. So my father was an expert in intellectual property. Was one of the best lawyers in Latin America on patents and. And, and property rights. So, but he, he used to teach me a lot about that. And he used to say, this is the whole development of, in, of property rights was meant originally, no, I'm not saying now, was meant to help society to develop. Now we reached this point that we are in the midst of the pandemic and these property rights are preventing us from getting out. So there's something wrong there. I'm not saying that we can abolish, perhaps we can't, but some, we need to do something, no? Mm. Uh, we need to do something. Uh, um, we, we cannot apply, I mean, again, this Pope says, this is not to be, you're not, that's nothing to do about socialism or <laughs> liberalism. This is about common sense and the common good. So how on earth are we, we believe that the market rules are, are dogmas, are untouchable, They're, they aren't. We have been subsidizing fossil fuel industries for for decades. So why are not subsidizing? And we are subsidizing actually public, no, sorry, not private, but we are subsidizing health industries to produce the vaccine. So therefore, we need to address this in, into a, into the public as a public common as a public good, which requires some thinking. Uh, do you know that we, we can go back to Eleanor Olstrom no? on, on all, on all her, her theories about, uh, about the administration of public goods. Uh, we can go back to also Amartya Sen about the capabilities approach. Uh, we can go, and, and you, you, can, you can keep naming economists or sociologists or <laughs> politicians. It's, it's very important. That's why the role of, so of people like you that are based on a very good and well-respected university is, is very much needed now because we need, we cannot get a, address, this is this was the Pope's words, eh? we cannot address a new problem with old ideas. I, I think he quoted Einstein, not that, at that meeting, but this is the case. And, and that's why, I mean, people at universities, we need to address the complexity uh, and something that is feasible it, it, and is possible. Uh, because it's political, it's economic. This is one thing on the vaccine. And the other is what can the church do? The, cur the church can do many things on the vaccine. One is address this, the whole ethical process. Another is convening power because we don't have any vested interests. We don't have any national interest. And the third one is the trust that we can, um, 
we can promote trust in a process. Um, what does it mean, trust in a process? We know that the vaccine, by, in history, we know that vaccination was key to get out of pre -pan previous pandemics. We know that we, this is the cheapest way and the, and the fastest way of getting out of pandemics. So particularly of this one that is so contagious, the virus. So yes, alternative treatments are welcome, but if we don't have a, a critical mass that is vaccinated, we cannot have the same life as before. We wouldn't be able to have it, even if we are rich. The vaccine is, the, the virus, the coronavirus is, is demonstrating something that Catholic social teaching have been saying for a while. That is, uh, you cannot develop your own self isolated from your community. Mm. We are persons in relation and we are, we belong to the people, we belong to a group, we belong to a country. And at the end, we are one hum, human family because we are all brothers and sisters and brothers. We are all sons and daughters of the same God and we have the same dignity. This is what we believe. Yeah. But this is, the, the virus is showing us that. This, there's no distinction between rich and poor. The Psalms already said that, you see? The, 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 the sun rises for the rich and the poor. The virus applies for the rich and the poor. If, and therefore the solution for the virus has to, needs to be that. We cannot, even if the rich, we are all vaccinated. Okay. And if, my, if the homeless that is next outside my house is not vaccinated, I won't be, I won't solve the problem. This is, in a way, good news because we get, we get out together, together mean all, particularly the most vulnerable, particularly the elderly, the homeless, the migrants, the ones who are in prison, the, the healthcare, uh, serve, uh, uh, people who work in healthcare services, it's, uh, uh, um, teachers, I mean, people who work on the streets. If, if, we don't, if we don't get out together, there's no way to get out. So this is, this is forcing us to create uh, synergies in order to ideate this new society that it is emerging, no? That is more inclusive, it's more circular, it's more sustainable. Um, and this is what the book talks in La Otto Cien Fratelli Tutti. And this is what we're trying to do with the, with the Vatican COVID Commission in alliance with others. Today I had a one hour conversation with the Vatican, with the Anglican COVID Commission. And they are, we are very much aligned and we're trying, we have regular meetings with a, a international institutions, the World Health Organization, or the Gavi, the COVAX, the UNICEF, the, the key players on, on this thing, no? with, with Catholic organizations, health, healthcare Catholic organizations. Sister Carol Keenan, I don't know if you know her, yeah. she's very well known in the US. Sister Carol Keenan is, the, the, is leading the, uh, health task force of the COVID commission. Wonderful, wonderful. Augusto, let me segue a little into uh, Catholic social teaching in the post-COVID world, because as you know, uh, Pope Francis issued a number of uh, very important general audiences in the second half of uh, 2020 on Catholic social teaching in the post-COVID world when he talked about you know, we have this small but terrible virus, but we have these larger viruses of inequality and environmental destruction. Can you talk a little bit about what the, what the Pope was doing in those, in those general audiences and what lessons uh, COVID teaches us for these bigger issues in Catholic social teaching that are so important to the Pope? Thank you, Tony, for asking that. Because for, I don't know if the rest of us know, but um, so the first time we met, we, 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 we know each other for a while with Tony, but we have been wrestling how to promote Catholic social teaching, which is still our best kept secret <laughs> since the, that book of the eighties. And the Pope, the Pope in the middle of the pandemic in last summer, well, in the summer in the North Hemisphere, not as is, uh, July, September, he issued a series of catechises on uh, the COVID and Catholic social teaching principles. It was amazing. <laughs> so only the, uh, and instead of talking about only Catholic social teaching, it was, I think it was the first catechism on Catholic social teaching as such, but he was mixing the principles of Catholic social teaching with 
faith, hope, and love with the three theological virtues, virtues, and applying those that explosive combination to uh, COVID responses. So if you haven't heard of it, I highly recommend it. It's online, it's on a book, it's uh, on our website. Um, but this is, um, what was he doing there? He was saying, of course he was saying, first of all, he said, one of the worst virus is the individualism. Remember he repeated in Fratelli Tutti in a couple of, of months later. And it's true, if individualism is a virus because we are not individualistic by nature. That's not true. <laughs> Otherwise we won't be, everybody wants to be loved. That's a, a, that proves that we are not individualistic. We can, so we are persons in relations again this. So the virus of individualism, you apply the virus of individualism to economics. What do you have? Neoliberalism. You apply this to sociopolitics. What do you have? You have these nationalisms, these uh, populisms, <laughs> no? Because it's individualism of, of your own people. Uh, you apply this uh, in, in health. What do you have? Well, I, is, 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 let's have health those who can pay for it. Well, you apply this to school, education. For, you, know, you start applying the virus of individualism to different uh, to the different stages of society, and it's terrible. So the cure, he says, to the virus that is, is not just vaccines or alternative treatments. It has to be the value of the common good. It has to be the value of the common good. So the common good cannot be just a common place where everyone see the common good. We all talk about the common good. Nobody, nobody knows what we are talking about. So, the, so what does it mean the common good? Well, it would take ages to, but in a nutshell, what do we have in common? Well, now we have a common problem that needs common solutions. But you apply that, no, it's not just the virus. We have a common problem in economics. We have a common problem in security. We have a common problem with the ecological crisis, particularly this ecological crisis underpinning everything. That's why the Pope said also in that audience, we don't want to recover something that was destroying, that, that was creating gaps between poor and rich and that was destroying the planet. We need something to recover. Now is the time to recover something that is friendly to the to our to the earth and and that is good to all people not to some so this is the the, the analogy that he was trying to play as the vaccine as the cure for that pandemic should be for all or that they won't be cured the cure to our economical and ecological problems should be for all or there won't be any cure did, did you see what, what the pope was trying to to do mm, definitely that was superb thanks augusto um, let me take a few questions. People are putting some questions in the chat, so I'll just pick a few of them. Um, one says about the, the importance of independence, uh, interdependence, but we seem to live in a world where self-interest dominates. How do we brill, bridge these perspectives? How do we get past this individualism? Well, here is what, well, when we have a lot to offer. Uh, religions in general. Religions cannot. We, of course, we can be troublemakers, and we can be, we can make, we can declare and and and, and, and do war, war uh, and fight in the name of our faith. But if you delve deep into our the big religions, we there's there's a big call to the, to peace to the good of humanity and to take out the best of humanity because we believe in trans something that is transcendent and something that is sustaining us so so religions have a lot to offer here uh, in terms of um of getting out of um of in, in, an, an individualistic mentality think about the liturgy just to, just to make it simple, no? because that, so to make an argument that everybody can understand. Religious rights, religious rights in general, say, and, and this is a anthropological research, as I'm sure most of you know, religious rights are the anti-individualistic thing. I cannot do it on my own. Yes, of course I can pray on my own, but 
a religious right is a, is a is communitarian by definition. Mm -hmm. Now, also religious rights, uh, they transcend the short termism because you always you have a notion of time different. You always have you're always doing a memory of something that of the past, bringing it to the present, and hoping into a new future, and praying. No, you're praying. There's a connection also between life and death. You're there's always religious rights. A, pray for the, the ones departed, no? And, and so look at all these elements. So it's communal by definition, a different notion of time. Uh, and and th therefore they can be cures or vaccines, I would say, to individualism and to short-termism. And short-termism is applied not just in business and not just in CEOs that they have, actually, but also in shareholders. Short-termism can be applied in presidents, and well, I don't have to mention because you 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 have to look at, at our recent history to see short-termism of political leaders in many countries in the world. Mm -hmm. It could be applied also to religious leaders. So, but religious rights can help us to 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 bring a different notion of time. Uh, so, they, just to say some things, and also most of religious rights are linked. With nature, so they are, we understand humanity as part of the of God creation. So it can help us also to rebalance the social systems with the ecosystems because we are part of the ecosystems actually. So look at the three elements of religious rights. Now this is anthropological research. Now apply this to our own liturgy, Catholic liturgy. Well, we don't have to reform any liturgy. We need to re revitalize it, and that will just to start with. So everybody can contribute to, to get out of this individualistic approach of this short-termism of this notion of nature as something alien to us. This, is, this could be, and because 80% of the world claim to be religious somehow, or, and they practice some, if religious are united, we can contribute a lot to this change. That is Fratelli Tutti. Mm -hmm. You see, so Fratelli Tutti and Laudato Si has to be understood together because the, if all religions, we promote this, we are all sisters and brothers, and we, how do you say, we externalize the outcome of our liturgies, of our rights, into our life, into our day-to-day -day lives, then the change can come also there. While we are advocating, of course, in the, in, in the, uh, the United Nations, nationally, with big companies, etc. But we can be part of the change. That's the beauty of this crisis. That's the beauty of, of also every single religious person has something very, very important to contribute, to get out of individualism, to get out of short-termism, and to get out of the notion of nature as alien. Thanks, Augusto. There's a few questions in the chat. A lot of people here are working on business education. And I think there's a real interest in understanding how Catholic social teaching can inform a kind of a revitalized approach to business education. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Augusto? Say that again, Tony. I, I... Yeah, the role of Catholic social teaching in kind of reforming and revitalizing huh. business education. Okay. Yeah. Think it like this. Who are the ones in, at least in the Western world, not to be, who are the ones who created schools? Who are the ones who created the notion of schools or the notion of universities? Who were? While you think about that, I will, I will bring you to another question. Who are the ones who created the notion of modern hospitals? It was the church. The church has started to, to, to create this hospice. The church started to create these notion, the universities. The first universities were created by the church. Even the universities, the predecessors of American universities that are the, the British ones, they were created. If you go to Oxford, they're still, they're still having the same even buildings. They were monasteries. Or you go to the Sorbonne, Lundberg. so the notion of that, we, we, who are the ones who 
uh, contribute to the modern notion of education to poor people, religious orders. So if the church and religious orders were able to do that in the past, in past centuries, why shouldn't we be able to do that now? What does it mean? That the model of business that we have now is broken, is dead, there's no future. Now, we cannot get rid of that, but we have to, to create something new. And that starts with the notion of business and with the notion of economy, with a notion of economy you know, that is proper, that is producing and caring at the same time, you know, as, the, as the chapter two of Genesis says with the land, you know, to cultivate and to care. They have always to be a notion of economy, the el economos, the order of the house, but therefore that we care for the house, not we, did, we don't destroy it. A notion of business, no? the Pope says this in Let Us Dream. I don't know if you have read that. Let Us Dream, the book says, um, the, he, he, he quotes this, the idea of the, the word of corporations. Corporations, Do you know the, the corp, no, corporations come from the, 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 the corpse, this, the, the body, the body of somebody, no? And, and, uh, and, um, and so it's, 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 a, it's a group of people who are considered a body and therefore with a purpose, not just the, yes, of course they produce things, they, they make a, a living for it, but we have, they have a purpose to contribute to society. Uh, they they break the bread together. No? Uh, uh, he, he, he calls the idea of of, of corporations of co of companies. Companies, companies is we break the bread together. Company. That, that, so that means that we share the bread together. So all all these ideas were originally very Christian. So we should be able to bring back to business something similar that we did with schools for everybody or hospitals or universities in the 21st century. This means starting with education because most young people, they don't want to inherit a worse world and they will inherit a terrible world, worse than the one I inherited. So they don't like that. Young people, they, they, most of them, they, they know that. Uh, and why are we not forming the leaders of the future that they will create the new business? I don't know if we will see it or not. Hopefully, I, I pray to God that I, I want to see it because it has to be soon. But the, the formation of future leaders in business schools cannot be part of the problem. They should be part of the solution. We cannot train people, at least with a in, within the Catholic tradition to be part of the problem, short-term mission, disconnection with nature, mat understanding economics merely as material growth, understanding business of this is my bus business is business and then I, I do business six days a week and then I go to church. No, no, that's, that's, that's not Christian. So how can we, re how can we change that? How can we turn upside down that? We should need to start with formation and with education. Now that's not easy because it's complex. How do you, well, that's what universities are for, business schools are for. Imagine a university offering a business school for the 21st century, where it's not just damage limitation. We are not going to teach you only how to limit the damage of what economics is doing or what the product, current economics is doing. Well, let's, uh, so financially speaking, for example, let's create some green bonds. Well, yeah, not bad, but that's not the solution. Well, then let's um, uh, subsidize the recycling. Well, okay, but that's not the solution. The thing is, how do we design products that are not just recyclable, that can be even, that can contribute to something good after they are, that we dispose them. How can we change the notion of consumption? Yeah, of course we need consumption, but what consumption, how? How can we change the notion of finance? And again, finance is key because finance can speed up and scale up the change for good or for ill. Now, finance should be at the service of the economy and not the other way around as it is now. So how can we for train the people of the future that 
in 10 years time, 15 years time, when they're in good positions, they know this because they know it by training. They learn it at the university and they are eager to apply it rather than keep training people as being part of the problem. So the poor, poor things, then they go there as CEOs or as ministers and they don't know, they realize the problem, but they, not done, they don't know what to do because they are not trained to do something different. So for me, this is key, that question. Thank you for asking, I don't know who asked that, but for me, the future of economics uh, depends on how do we train the future economists. And business schools have a lot to say and business schools have a lot to do and we need to be ambitious. The, and you belong to the Jes Jesuit tradition in Fordham. So the Jesuits were the ones who change actually the teaching, the, the way the, the, of schools, etc. Why, why can we not do it now? We can. Uh, it is possible. It is difficult, but it is possible and feasible. That's great. Thank you. And I, I, you know, I always come back to Pope Francis in Laudato Si when he says business is a noble vocation, but only when it serves the common good. I think that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that, that's really important. And many of us here at, uh, are at Fordham, but also other universities who are trying to work on how to reform economics and business education across the board. And we're actually, like you with the COVID commission, we're not just talking about it, we're actually implementing it. We're actually teaching courses on it now. So, um, and I think, you know, we're, we're finding great insights from Catholic social teaching as we get into that. Now, let, let me ask another question on a, on a different topic. And this topic is, is a question about women in the church. It says, women in the church have traditionally worked in the trenches and surface solutions from the bottom up. How is that role being utilized in our current crisis? So tell us a little bit about the role of women in the church. I know you work, you work with a lot of very, um, uh, very um, talented women and they're helping you with your commission. So and you talk a little bit about that, Augusto. Yes, I, in this sense, I prefer to walk the talk <laughs> rather than to talk. It just, I, uh, if you look at my team, it's not just gender balance. I think there are more women, not because I selected women on purpose, but amazingly, when we were in the recruiting process, well, the best, we have always, no, a short, uh, short listed uh, three or four, and the, the best were, were the ones we selected, and the best were the women. I mean, not saying, but they, yes, and today, uh, Sister Alessandra Smerili, who is the, was until today, or still is the head of the Economic Task Force of the Vatican Communities, the Pope Francis appointed her under secretary of the Dicastry of Interhuman human development. So she will be working with me. So this is, this is the, I mean, it's not just women, it's women and men, in my opinion, no? men and women, but of course in the church, at least in the decision makers, we are totally imbalanced, but, um, but women are, because now we, the, 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 now we have these very well-trained women or religious, or so so this is the this is an opportunity also now women in covid in general in, in within the church so think about the women who are working in as doctors or as ceos of companies or as leading a re religious orders that are working with the very poor with the marginalized think about the, the, who are who are working with the homeless who are working with the with the refugees who are i mean in in well, you will find a lot of women there. So, so this would be my answer. I mean, it's, my answer always disappoints many. I know that and I understand it, but I can do what I can do in that sense. So my, in my team, you come to and see my team and you won't complain. <laughs> uh, and, and this is the way we, we the Asinodal Church walks along. I mean, I cannot change by decree, they, 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 well, nobody, I, I, I mean, even the Pope, the church, but, but the contribution, it's important. I mean, uh, and in leading positions, 
as well, but also the way you understand leadership is because Pope Francis was a bit upset. If we keep understanding leading positions in a total hierarchical way, we will struggle without, regardless of the <laughs> gender balance or imbalance. It's also the understanding of leadership, the, what matters, no? because a more collegial church, a more synodal church will, will find a way. This is what Pope Francis is trying to, to push for. And this is where we're trying to walk. So also Sister Natalie Beckward, that is, has been appointed under secretary for the, uh, for the um, secretary of the synod. She was having lunch with us the other day um, just to, 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 she wanted to learn something. She wanted to, to know the things that we learned in the COVID commission to us to apply to the similar process. So there are lots of things going on. So there's hope. This is what I know that my answer is disappointing or could be disappointing for some, but there's hope. Don't, don't worry that there are lots of things going on. That's great. Thank, thanks, thanks, Augusto. Um, uh, let me ask, um, again, shifting gears a little bit. I wanna, one of Pope Francis's um, uh, talks last year was on subsidiarity. Now, subsidiarity, in my view, is probably the most misunderstood principle of Catholic social teaching, <laughs> especially in America where people think subsidiarity just means small government, uh, like a libertarian <laughs> understanding. Could you, in your expertise, tell us what a, a proper understanding of subsidiarity actually is for a Catholic? Well, um... I would recall, it's difficult because I used to, to teach that we would require a whole, a whole session, but, but to paraphrase Pope Francis and his catechesis, which is brilliant, he was saying, think about something that is top down and, and bottom up. You have to understand subsidiarity in a circular way. So it has nothing to do to small or big, because subsidiarity you can, is, the, is the principle who suggests that suggests that uh, you have to allow the lesser um, institutions or organisms of the society or people to do what they can do and not to interfere. Think about a family to, to understand it, no? You need to allow your children as they grow up to do what they can do. Otherwise they will be, they won't mature. Uh, and so this is one part. That is the most common, commonly understood, as you said, Tommy. No, so it's uh, so, okay. That means so I don't do anything so that they others can grow. Well, more or less, because subsidiarity cannot be understood without participation. So some people require. Think about a family again. Some people can mature with just a little bit of help. Boom, off they go. Some people, some children require more, more attention. And this is the same in society. Some groups require more attention. So it's not that you, I can leave them alone. Ah, so if, if you don't grow, if, if it's, it's because of your fault. No, no. <laughs> so, so this is where, so you see the idea is that we all participate in the society. So we subsidize what we can in order to help the participation of the society. And we, are, we this is the, the, the tension or the circularity, I would say. Um, uh, and it's important because subsidiarity also cannot be understood with a, without the principle of a preferential option for the poor. <laughs> Precisely, uh, what are you, and, and this, this is, would be interesting also to discuss economically, why are you subsidizing? For example, let's, set, let's put it bluntly. Fossil fuel, in, we have been subsidizing fossil fuel industries for decades. Why? Because we thought, countries thought that subsidizing fossil fuel industries was good for the development of a country. No? Well, now we discover that mm, we're not so that sure about it. Well, we need energy, of course, but where is the energy, is, where, is, where is it going to come from? So. You see, what are we going to subsidize? This is the time to subsidize a just transition towards, towards a new energy. Not because, so we cannot keep subsidizing what is, harm, is hurting us. So we need to subsidize the just transition so the just transition is not, um, 
is not covered or is, or is not put on the shoulders of those who are already burdened or the poor. So subsidiarity, participation, option for the poor are part of it. And also subsidiarity, the last thing I would say, you cannot understand subsidiarity without solidarity. For me, are the two sides of the coin. So I remember when I used to teach uh, Catholic teaching, I remember to put coins and to the principles, no? Human dignity, individual human dignity is very important. You cannot understand human dignity without common good. Human dignity and common good are two sides of the coin. You see? The other, the other coin would be subsidiarity and solidarity. Solidarity is good, but without subsidiarity, mm, inequally, subsidiarity without subsidiarity, mm, I don't know. I remember reading for Christmas one editorial of the Times in England, uh, and the, the editors, they were saying that they were upset with the bishops, the Catholic bishops, because they were criticizing the consumerism of, for Christmas. Can you imagine? Because they were saying that Christmas is not about consumption. Christmas is about another thing. And they were criticizing the bishops for jeopardizing the economy of the country. <laughs> so, so, and they were using the, 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 the word, even the territory of subsidiarity to say they should be, no, of so solidarity. They should be focused on, on solidarity and to give to the poor. And so we, we, we consume more and then we give to the poor what we what we left out. This was an editorial. You see, but you see how how the principles are wrongly understood. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that subsidiarity and solidarity, if we need to have a new universal solidarity, we need to understand and apply the principle of subsidiarity to enable people to be artisans of their own destiny. Mm -hmm. This is what St. Paul, Saint John, Saint Paul VI said in Populum Progressio, mm -hmm. be artisans of your own destiny. So those who cannot, well, we all, all the others that we can, we help them. I said all siblings, we, they help the other, the, the, the sister or the brother who cannot. Otherwise we become like animals. I was, of course, if because this person cannot, or even sometimes I, I have arguments with my mom. I say, oh, they, they, she believes that the poor are poor because it's their fault. Well, how can it be their fault? I mean, that's this. This is a narrative that needs to be challenged. Nobody wants to be poor, or, or if they are people, well, I'm very sure. I mean, people are happier. People are, when they can develop their own uh, their own selves, when they can thrive. But this, if the circumstances prevent them from shining, from developing, then we have to change the, the circumstances that are the structures. If we come to the structures, in the meantime, we do something this. We apply these principles. Can can I don't know if it's clear or not, but that's very if, if it's not, uh, ask me another question because I want to clarify. It's not that, clear. <laughs> that no, no, to me that that's very clear, and there's no, and the, there's nobody seems confused in the questions. But Augusta, we're almost at the end of our time. I'm going to give the mm -hmm. last question to a priest from the Philippines, and uh, this questioner asks. Um, go, it goes back to about vaccines. What concrete steps should business professors and students, church leaders do to impact government policies on vaccine distribution, especially in third world countries where corruption, lack of access and disinformation are prevalent? This is from our priest friend in the, in, in the, from the Philippines. Thanks for asking. We, we can do lots of things. We have produced and we worked a lot at uh, what is called a resource kit for local churches that I highly recommend is on our website. I don't know if somebody can put it on website. I will put it while I, while I, while I talk. Uh, and if somebody from my team is listening, you can put that resource kit, uh, the link. The resource kit has been developed so that parishes, families, groups in hospitals, maybe groups of students can use it to, to discuss this, to discuss the issues of the vaccine the ethical issues of the vaccine, to challenge misinformation and to be clear about the information of vaccines. Of course, you can go to the WHO website, but, who, but most people won't, which is not bad. But so this is a clear resource kit for ordinary people. So what you can do as students or professors, or you can challenge the misinformation and the fake news. What this is, 
I, I'm not being, I'm not exaggerating this. This is really, really one of the key problems at the moment. The misinformation on vaccines and fake news is horrendous. I mean, I, it's almost evil, I would say, because we're we are dealing with the, the, the health and the life and of human beings and with the whole structures of humanity. With the millions of people have lost their jobs and countries are in lockdown, people cannot develop. I mean, we, it is very serious what's, what's going on. Vaccine is the, it's the only way of getting out uh, of this. It's not the only way of getting out of the whole crisis, but it's the best road that we, need, we know. And also we have to praise, this is another important thing. Let's start praising this science that we have at present. They have developed a vaccine in record time. A vaccine normally takes decades to, be, to develop in one year. This shows how the capacity of human beings, all these people like creativity, capacity, innovation. This is innovation in action. You see, to develop this, this vaccine in one year and, and different companies. So we need to start talking seriously about that, about the ethical dimensions of vaccines and, and also about the consequences. If you are a professor in economics or business, there are lots of, of, um, of models I, I don't know if you have seen some, Tony, but there are lots of, of, of cost models of what would it cost uh, to the world if we don't su succeed in, in vaccinating 60, 70% of the population? What would be the economic cost? And, it's, and there are different models, all of them, even the, the, the most, no? I don't know, Michael, if you can shed light on that, but there are lots of models uh, on that, and and you can start discussing this on, on in, in your in your in your classrooms or with your students, to, uh, and to and to and to make it simple, to make a clear message and to spread it around, to, and to send it to to leaders also in the world. We discovered in, in Tony in this in the COVID Vatican COVID Commission that leaders are very busy. So don't don't think that leaders they have time to sit down and read all the things. So you have to provide them with materials that are easy to read, that they can digest and they can spread to their constituencies. So this is something that, that universities can do at the moment, no? is particularly business schools. Um, because the, the consequence is like the climate crisis or the ecological crisis. The costs of not addressing that crisis are, are in unimaginable, unimaginable. You remember uh, Lord Stern having these models of the cost of the cost of inaction is terrible. So let's act. So even if you don't believe, <laughs> uh, for even from economic something, the economic, economic perspective um, could be. But also to provide material to leaders and also to the commission and to religious leaders. In the Philippines, uh, in the Philippines, the church is very strong, and the church wants to follow the Pope in the Philippines. I know that, and he, they are following the Pope, of course. In this regard, in the in the particular, in this regard, and, and the vaccines, let's provide more elements, more business, economic elements to that. Um, uh, that that's something concrete that you could do. Okay, Father Augusto, thank you very much for the hour you spent with us. It was wonderful discussion. Um, just for the general people, we will be doing this uh, moral economy seminar once a month, so stay tuned. Um, but it's going to be hard to beat our discussion with Father Augusto. Uh, Augusto, would you mind um, staying on for a couple of minutes uh, with Michael and me just to, just to discuss something? Uh, but And everybody else, feel free to uh, leave the meeting. Uh, so thank you all very, very much. And I see a lot thank of people you. in the chats. Send, send, Tony, before you send people off, say, I don't mind if, if people want to send feedback, even if it's a one. Send feedback so because I, if you want to, so even if I cannot answer this now, it's good for me because it, it triggers my, my thinking and, and challenges my, my team, yeah. and myself. So, so thanks, send us feedback. Anybody, any feedback, send it to me and I will make sure it gets to Father Augusto.